questions of representation and other things uh, in the um, in the uh, age of the world picture or the time of the world picture, which is probably a better translation of Zeit. Um, Michael, um, yeah. Yeah. did you uh, are you going to put up the uh, that speech that he gave at the uh, at the left forum? Are you, is that going up uh, as well as part of the? Which speech was that? I'm sorry, Bill. I'm sorry. In the, yeah, in the middle of it, they, they uh, you guys played a speech that he gave at the left forum. Oh, yeah, um, I could put that up. Yes, that's uh, uh, Why Revolution Now? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Which is the more pressing question as we go forward today. I see Lazzarato just wrote something called Revolution or Fascism. It's no longer socialism or barbarism. Now it's being framed by the Italian school, revolution or fascism. And Maurizio Lazzarato is a very interesting uh, character, a, a kind of synthetic uh, moment of Deleuze and um, Guattari, as well as um, uh, the Italian autonomy of the zero work group of Tronchi and, uh, and Negre. So that's a, that's a new one? I'm sorry? That's a brand new one from Lazarus? Brand new from Simeo text, written about, about six months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he's, a, he's, a, he's one of the very best out there right now on, uh, I think, merging political economy, philosophy, and, uh, you know, all our social relations. Very, very smart. Yeah, yeah. And militant, to put, the, put it mildly, revolution or fascism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, David just put it up. Uh, okay, Phil. got to it already. Put the link. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah, why revolution now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, so yeah, so tonight, uh, again, the uh, uh, the question of uh, the uh, either the time of the world picture, if you want to go back and revisit a little bit of that, or, you know, I would like to move on, of course, to the question concerning technology, which was done um, many years later, 1955, November of 1955. Um, and uh, this again was a lecture, and the emphasis is on the question and the path of questioning. Uh, but first, yeah, any 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 uh, you know afterthoughts or lingering uh, uh, you know reflections from the last uh, week or two or three, <laughs> so to speak. And I also um, I prepared a little bit. Uh, you know, I have it in an old book, um, a preparation of the movement of phenomenology, at least in its early stages, you know, somewhat of its history. So you can have a background since both um, Heidegger and um, Stiegler and Kintler later are incredibly influenced by, you know, the phenomenological movement begun by Edmund Husserl, right? And uh, I would like to uh, also situate that in a tune uh, some of us, and I know Patrick and, and probably others, Richard, uh, know a lot of these names, uh, you know, we've been around and, uh, um, and uh, most probably Douglas too, that, but we can, we can uh, you know, go back and forth on some of these names and their contributions. Uh, to me, it's a very rich tradition, the phenomenological tradition. It's certainly open to critique, but it began uh, with uh, Edmund Husserl, um, and, you know, kind of codified itself as a movement in philosophy, not just a school, but a real movement in philosophy. And um, if, if you're interested, look, I know we're all, you know, uh, very busy in all of this, but again, Herbert Spiegelberg, um, who was at the Washington University in St. Louis, wrote a book, a two volume study of the phenomenological movement. And every time you'd see him in person, oh, it's out of date, out of date. You know, he just wrote something a week earlier. So, you know, he was, he was this kind of character, but very, very good book, uh, Herbert Spiegelberg. But I thought I'd at least give us this background because Heidegger is different in the movement, you know, much more of the emphasis on language, but, you know, um, um, there, there are people that did a lot of work on language. And, you know, I, I, do, I do recommend, and I know um, uh, uh, Carl and Patrick have some affinity here, Merleau-Ponty, uh, especially his later work, The Visible and the Invisible, his working notes that never really made it into a book. But they're pretty phenomenal investigations there, you know, uh, on the dialectic and interrogation. 
And uh, I want to mention that as well, you know, in this whole thing of concealing, revealing, you know, Merleau-Ponty took this up through, again, the art of seeing the visible and the invisible and stayed a little closer to Husserl than to Heidegger, but brought a Heideggerian, you know, a lethiological attempt method to his, to his uh, investigations. So anyway, let me, let, me, let me start there and then we'll go to the question concerning technology and some of the stakes um, involved there. So in 1887, um, um, Husserl wrote his first uh, a la la Badiou, 100, you know, almost 100 years earlier. Uh, the concept of number was his first work. You know, and, and as many of you know, Badiou uh, published late his work on number. Uh, later in mathematical ontology. Then the philosophy of arithmetic was 1891. So you can see phenomenology began um, as an investigation into mathematical ideality, you know, into mathematical ontology. This was not a movement out of poesis, if you will, since he uses this term in technology. It was a movement in mathesis and mathemata. You know, instead of the poetic. So you have these two ontologies really actually playing out very early on in the phenomenological movement and this kind of attempt to put philosophy back on the, the concrete, if you will, towards the concrete, the study of concrete essences, the battle cry, of course, being to the things themselves. You know, this was the, the, the battle cry of phenomenology to get back to the essential insights of essential, the scene of the essence, this kind of activity of the, of the mind. So 1900 marks a great uh, date. I, I think I've talked about 1900 to me is uh, four major works are about to happen or what, three major works in one death. Nietzsche dies, you know, he's totally mad, but he dies in 1900. Freud publishes The Interpretation of Dreams. Husserl publishes Logical Investigations, which was studied very, very actively by uh, Heidegger among, and Derrida, especially chapter six on expression and meaning, which was the early Derrida voice and phenomena. And, um, um, and uh, you know, studied actively by a whole group of logicians for many, many years. So this was another book that came out that year. And then there's a book in, uh, in terms of Wall Street, The Theory of Speculation, Louis Bachelet, who was a French mathematician who came up with principles of financial speculation. You know, and a very few Marxists really go there, but it's a very interesting text. It comes out in 1902, used very actively by many people in the realm of mathematical finance. You know, and this is a, a new, new kind of field that's obviously opened up in terms of hedge funds, uh, SPAC, special project acquisition companies, et cetera, the new financialization uh, moments that Wall Street is very adept at creating new products to keep us in this, uh, what I would call moments of forced financialization, you know, in some ways and, you know, um, so um, anyway, so 1900 is the, the, and then the idea of phenomenology uh, comes out in 1907. So this is a really uh, upsurge, uh, you know, the turn of the century in many ways. Of course, the psychoanalytic movements are uh, really underway. The committee's founded, et cetera. It's starting to get some traction, um, you know, especially in Europe. Freud is here. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Richard, 1909 at Clark University, he comes to give the lectures. Introduction to Psychoanalysis, invited by William James, right? Uh, yeah. I believe so, yes. Yeah, and uh, yeah. And uh, then um, and then there's a yearbook that's put out where papers would go for phenomenology. And then in um, uh, 1919 to 22, this is when Heidegger's relationship begins. Heidegger is literally only about, um, um, you know, Heidegger's born, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 1889. So 1919 and uh, until um, uh, 1922, Heidegger is the assistant to Husserl in, in Freiburg. And he publishes Being in Time in 1927. And when it was dedicated to Edmund Husserl uh, in 1927. Um, Husserl's comment on it, and this may be one reason, I'm, I'm just, uh, again, this is conjecture, uh, conjecture about what happened, but, uh, it, it, it's clear to me that maybe Heidegger, you know, at least clear in my conjecture, that Heidegger's um, obsession against philosophical anthropology, 
and his critique of anthropology is because Husserl criticized him in being in time of indulging in philosophical anthropology, right, in many ways. So the phenomenological tradition was really, you know, adamant about not getting back to philosophical anthropology, back to this Kantian moment and, uh, you know, uh, very, very clear. So this might be something else. Of course, the, uh, the um, 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 you know, the, uh, the, the movement of Dasein, et cetera. Anyway, Husserl goes to Paris, 1931. Um, you know, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, Lacan's thesis on the paranoid personality comes out in 32. He's probably attending or knows of the lectures of, um, of uh, Husserl as well as Kojev. These are two great moments in French intellectual life. Uh, Husserl gave lectures on the Cartesian uh, meditations, as well as he gave what was called the Paris lectures. Emmanuel Levinas, Levinas is a, a major figure in all of this, writes a book on the theory of intuition on Wesen uh during this period of uh, the, the early 30s. Kojev is giving, of course, the lectures at um, uh, on Hegel, you know, the introduction to the reading of Hegel, the lectures for six years that are transcribed by Raymond Corneau. So you have this long period and then a teacher who ended up at the, uh, I think I told you the story, Aaron Gervich was one of the early phenomenologists. He was in Paris, he had sought refuge and he was the teacher of Merleau-Ponty and wrote very, very good books on fields and theories of consciousness. So you had really in philosophy, this kind of consciousness if you will, lack of a better term, industry that was created around the phenomenological tradition, the intentionality of us towards objects, how our stances, our position, our suspension of natural attitude, how we perceive all of these things began to be thrown into question and really a new way of seeing was operating. Garbage ended up at the New School for Social Research with Hans Jonas and Hannah Arendt and um, uh, Gerbich was uh, very famous for his lectures when he would come in and say, ladies and gentlemen, there are two black sheep in the history of philosophy, um, René Descartes and Baruch Spinoza. They will be, we will deal with René Descartes this semester. I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, there are no questions. So one fool took the opportunity of trying to ask a question. There was never a question asked in Gerbich's classes ever again. This poor guy, I mean, like when I heard, I wasn't there, but I, I heard the stories from people who were actually there. So Gerbich was a, a major and, and completely forgotten today. I mean, this was mm -hmm. phenomenological psychology at work, you know, completely forgotten, the field of consciousness, theory of science as well. So anyway, 1936, and I, I'm really trying to situate this text in Heidegger a little better. 1936 is the publication of the crisis of the European sciences. You know, Heidegger has already taken over Freiburg as the rector. He gives the rectoral address, 33, 34. He gives lectures on nature, um, history, and the state. <laughs> There's a whole series of lectures about this. Smacks of the order of you know the regime at that time it really does you can read a lot of things into that with all again uh, due respect for some of the apologetics of heidegger during that period um you know but um yeah it's it's, it's pretty clear where he was trying to go as the rector that that year at least um but the crisis of the european sciences was again attempt to stay away from philosophical anthropology and could be read i mean this is a can be of course we read as a response to being in time too, as well. So this is a very interesting moment as well in the Husserlian phenomenological tradition versus that of the hermeneutical ontology of Heidegger, if you will, that kind of dialectical tension that plays out. Uh, and, uh, you know, during this period, of course, in France, Sartre is emerging, uh, Levinas, these are the major phenomenologists. Merleau-Ponty doesn't publish until later. Uh, Merleau-Ponty has a uh, all-out assault, assault on behaviorism in a book called The Structure of Behavior. And then his masterwork, if you will, is the phenomenology of perception. Yeah, and uh, this is a very major work by him. So anyway, um, Husserl passes away, you know, um, um, uh, I think in the late, uh, uh, you know, late, um, um, 
30s or maybe early 40s. Um, uh, he converts to Christianity, by the way, is Jewish by, uh, he converted to Christianity in the end, uh, you know, and uh, kind of interesting uh, in, that, in that way. Anyway, another crucial moment, let's just take Heidegger. Of course, I've mentioned this, the 36 to 1940 um, lectures on Nietzsche, which were attended by Baumler and by Alfred Rosenberg. The police were there in the lectures. You have to read them very highly coded in some ways. He knows who's in the audience, uh, et, et cetera. So uh, please keep that in mind. But, um, you know, going back here, the really crucial turn, you know, Heidegger is a part of the denazification uh, period. He can't teach and back until 51. He was, he's forbidden to teach from 45, uh, 46 until 1951. He's allowed back in the, uh, the classroom to give seminars. Um, although he's paid between 46 to 51, I must say. Um, and, uh, but anyway, 1947 is the letter on humanism, which um, you know, for some people here, I think Sean, uh, Josh have heard, and Phil have heard uh, some lectures that I've done on, you know, and some investigations as the turning the letter on humanism is uh, Heidegger's attack against Sartrean existentialism at one level, but also a whole long humanistic tradition. Again, a kind of maybe response, if you will, to the crisis in European sciences in another way. Because I'd like to read, I mean, I'm trying to read this in terms of the layers of texts, right? And, you know, the intertextuality that is, that is going on, as well as the historical moment. 47, the letter on humanism. Again, you know, the totalitarian uh, regimes, if, if you want to use that language, or what happened in, in Germany, what happened in Italy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these, uh, the, these moments were part again of a will to power, a metaphysical will to power in an epoch could not be stopped because it was faulty thinking or a faulty sending that put people in this thing. It's a kind of, you know, play that Heidegger has here, that the, the interpretation of the humanism itself and that kind of freedom was not uh, was not uh, part of really what the, the the philosophical moment was supposed to be, right? And that the anti the a humanism, if you will, that kind of moment needs to be really uh, you know privileged in a sense as we go forward. It's being so. We're going to go back to this in the uh, in the uh, question concerning technology because again, technology is something that we have not just created, you know, and he goes, he's very careful through, through this, um, you know, in terms of the, the human activity. So um, anyway, uh, just a couple of other things, you know, Paul Ricoeur is, is coming up as the major Catholic phenomenologist, if I could use that term, you know, he's someone who writes books like The Symbolism of Evil, The Philosophy of Will, and again, uh, if you're interested in these kind of things as a creative person, time and narrative is very interesting in terms of narratology, that kind of theory that was very popular about 25 years ago. Um, and um, then, of course, Tron Bok Tho, the Vietnamese philosopher who was very well respected by all of them, the, um, the, the phenomenology and dialectical materialism, which was the beginning of the encounters with Marxism, as, as well as Sartre's search for a method. So this is the beginning of the phenomenological, you know, it takes about 50 to 60 years for that real hardcore confrontation to take place with, with Marx, right? Even though Lukács mentions phenomenology, there's never really an ongoing, you know, conversation with it. Even though he knew many of these people, he knew Heinrich Rickert, he knew Emil Lask, he, he was educated by Zimmel, who, you know, had, had some of that background, of course, with Delphi and others in the, in the human sciences. So anyway, um, and then just bringing it up, I mean, of course, uh, you know, the phenomenological tradition, to my, to my mind, uh, Derrida ultimately, I think is, considers himself a phenomenologist. There's no question about it. He still goes back to work out so-called problems on genesis and structure, um, you know, um, and uh, certainly uh, problems in uh, his translation, The Origin of Geometry, uh, Voice and Phenomena too, 
are, are we speaking or writing subjects? Telegrammatology is very indebted to this, uh, another kind of synthetic moment between uh, Husserl, Heidegger, and André Leroy uh, Gorhan's works. So um, anyway, I just wanted to situate this, the whole thing about technology in a way, we're, we're gonna talk about this. I, I, I wanna, uh, when we get to Stiegler, we'll talk about grammatology versus technology in some ways, or you know how grammatology becomes part of Stiegler's apocal ter terminology rather than being. Right, we will we will speak to that later, um, you know, as we as we go forward. So anyway, I'll go to the text. I mean, I, I hope these little historical uh, pointers help situate a little bit to, to see that you know that there are always these tensions going on in the, in this thinking in many ways. Okay, Carl, I saw you had your hand up. I'm sorry, I just wanted to finish this little uh, brief uh, oh, historical yeah. excursion. Okay. I mean, yeah. we, we could skip over this, but I, I guess I just wanted to, if you could give a short, concise summary of how you see phenomenology breaking with the Cartesian tradition. I mean, it's pretty clear in what we read with Heidegger. You know, well, it's coming out of the Cartesian tradition. Right. I mean, it's, 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 it's <coughs> the tool I've read of Husserl is seen in some ways like, I mean, another take is that he, he brings it to completion in a certain way. It's kind of yeah, I know that that's a very good, uh, yeah, working uh, supposition because uh, you know it, it's obvious that Heidegger wants to see phenomenology as a culmination of Cartesian rationalism in the modern period. Yes, absolutely, that Husserl is this kind of uh, completion of the Cartesian project as well as a completion of the Kantian project. You know, and you know, bringing these th these things together. Yeah, yeah, no, no question about it. I mean, again, I mean, I can't do a due respect in, you know, five minutes, really, in, in a sense. But, you know, if you read, and I, I just just as, as primers, if you will, and this is something we, we've talked about in terms of um, doing from uh, the Institute now, you know, doing kind of guidelines to uh, some of these works. But as a primer, if you read Husserl's The Idea of Phenomenology, you'll get a real good sense of what it is as a, as a movement, right? Yeah, this is really what, you know, and that's available and also phenomenology is a rigorous science. Uh, Husserl thought that philosophy should be a science, right? And uh, I like to think of it as a science of making distinctions. That's what phenomenology really does, which is the Cartesian moment of having clear and distinct ideas. You know, another kind of clarity of getting to the essence of the objects themselves, right? In, in a way, you know? So this is an attempt to solve the res cogiton and the res extensa by bringing this under intentionality and it solves this kind of mind body dualism or outside inside operations you know and this is ongoing ongoing through all kinds of jargon you know there's technical language that's, that's involved but the idea of phenomena let me get to douglas uh, and i'll come back um, yeah. i just have a very quick comment and it yeah, triggers sure. something that is kind of uh, percolating but goes way back and so i'm not remembering it very clearly um, it was um, back in the 70s, there was a, uh, there's a book of essays and interviews with Foucault, where in this interview in the 70s, he was asked, um, if I can remember correctly, something like, there's been a turn away from phenomenology at this point, and it seems to be out of fashion. Where do you see that that shifted? And he's kind of said, and you, you gestured towards it with your last statement about Stiegler, he said something like this shift towards language. And you could say the grammatology, and yet what you're suggesting is I think true is the phenomenological has never really left, but it's right. been maybe submerged in a way. So that tension that we see in the seventies with Foucault and others, I see as very pertinent to our rethinking of Heidegger as well. <coughs> yes, uh, absolutely in agreement with you um, um, in, in many ways. Um, uh, what Foucault is talking to, and this is of course in his own work is, is words and things, the order of things, which is a kind of 
proto-structuralist text, that structuralism came in as an operation, right? <laughs> that yeah. was going to take away, <laughs> if you will, from the phenomenological, you know, tradition, right, and its movement, right? Mm -hmm. And no longer do you study phenomena, but you study structures, and you study structures yeah. symbolically. And you, you know, so in a way, it was the battle between a Levi Strauss and Sartre at one level. <laughs> Right, that yeah. it started, started to happen. In fact, if if you want, I mean, to me again, I I, I like. I mean, I, I don't know if this is the best way to go about it, but for me, it seems like the late 1950s, early 60s. If you read the debates between Sartre and um, and um, uh, Levi Strauss, particularly uh, the the uh, the Savage Mind, better translated, you know. Uh, you know, the, the uh, wild thought is a much better, you know, translation of uh, Savage uh, Pensee. But anyway, the savage mind, as it's translated in English, especially chapter nine on the axiomatic dialectic versus the critical dialectic in, in, um, in, uh, in, in, um, in Sartrean um, existentialism hyphen Marxism. And also, of course, and this is not published, although you can read uh, read into Althusser's Contradiction and Overdetermination, that essay as well. And you pretty much have the debate going on right there, right? The structuralism, phenomenology, that whole tradition. And there's been a move, uh, you know, in France, and this is important to um, uh, Spinoza, right? has made a, a, an appearance, right? <laughs> As against the Hegelian hyphen Heideggerian tradition. You know, when Heidegger writes the history of being, he lives Spinoza out. It's kind of interesting too, another black mark in the black books in, in many ways. But um, 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 yeah, so the Spinoza's turn also is very active here. And Althusser is part of that. In, in some ways, as you know, there becomes a, a whole new tradition of, you know, um, not Hegelian Marxists, but Spinoza's Marxists, right? But, you know, these are, you know, again, tendencies within something broader, you know, the structuralist approach. And of course, 1966 was the structuralist, uh, you know, salute in, in Baltimore, you know, the famous, yeah. the, 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 Hopkins. the, the unconscious yeah. is uh, Baltimore in the early morning. And he was right about that. I lived in Baltimore five years, <laughs> right? I've been out early in the morning in Baltimore. I actually <laughs> went to the site from where he, he, you know, I went to the place he was staying <laughs> to see what maybe he saw. But anyway, I, 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 anyway. So. So anyway, yeah, the structuralist, the invasion came in and then the re-emphasis through Heidegger in a certain way. Heidegger is kind of reoriented, not as a phenomenologist, not as part of the phenomenological tradition, but as, as part of the linguistic turn, if you will, right? Mm. Right, right. Term. So this is very important to remember. Heidegger becomes more famous, if you will, <laughs> after 66, especially in the United States, right? Yeah. Than he was you know, in uh, in the 40s and the early 50s in Germany, you know? Yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting, yeah. thank yeah. you. A lot of interesting, uh, interesting moment that, that, that occurred. And then, you know, the Heideggerian uh, machinery was put into motion, you know, at, at various uh, schools here, you know, and, and of course, uh, one person that made Heidegger, people read Heidegger more was Rorty's book on over, I mean, his essay called, Richard Rorty's uh, essay called Overcoming the Tradition. So if you're interested in this, you know, how the pragmatic tradition took it up. And, you know, uh, Rorty actually comes from a family of uh, the, the Bronx Trotskyists. <laughs> you know, he has a background. Right, right. Like, Wild yeah. Orchids. Wild yeah, Orchids. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, great book. Great book. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So um, anyway, so yeah, just to situate it, just the, the complexity yeah. of all this, it's, you know, again, uh, you know, David Winters and then his, uh, the next generation after him will have a lot to write about here and, uh, you know, <laughs> Jocelyn and, you know, a lot, a lot of paper still needs to be, uh, you know, spent on uh, all these uh, little, uh, <laughs> you know, nuances, layers, et cetera, that need to be uncovered. So anyway, so yeah, again, to situate this essay, the question concerning technology, you know, Heidegger obviously is, um, you know, still, I, I wanna try to, you know, again, connect um, the, the, um, the, um, 
uh, the age of or the, the the time of the world picture with this in some ways because he is going back to certain themes and I hope you saw at work you know Heidegger's main methodology which is to go back to the Greek and have this conversation with the German right uh, mo a lot of this essay is really a long reflection on book six of the Nicomachean ethics of of, of uh, Aristotle and the whole principles of causality and causa, how causa mistranslates really in a way, on, right? It's very interesting how this happens and, you know, and then how aspect thinking gets displaced. So I think this is very, very good in terms of the steps to give you again, an idea of how he comes to this. And to me, I'm, I'm very impressed with the materiality of the language here. You know, it's very materialist, right? This is not idealism at work. And in a way, you know, you can go back and read Capital and you see Heidegger and Marx are pretty close on coal and they're pretty close on mining, you know, deforestation, all of these things are kind of working here that are very interesting in terms of, you know, connections, right? In a way, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, but maybe I should hear from you first. Any any uh, you know thing that really struck you here in the um, in the, um, the the reading of uh, this? Uh, you know, uh, I think it's a masterwork. I mean, you know, it's a good table setter, if you will, for technology. Even though it's sixty five years ago, and he would be completely you know if he said only a god can save us now in sixty six, you can imagine what he would say in twenty twenty one. But anyway, so yeah. But anyway, I I, I really like I really like the way he he, you know, be begins this essay and, and builds it, you know, in a way the que questioning that begin builds a way. So maybe we can go through it that that way. Yeah. Any anybody? I mean, I have a very yeah. Richard, please. Yeah. Yeah. Just a question. Um, you know, during the whole economic crisis of. Uh, when did it start? 2007, 2000, the banking crisis or the... Bear, Bear Stearns was 2007, uh, early 2008, and Lehman was, uh, yeah, in the September of 2008, yeah, yeah. Yeah, during that time, I, I came to understand that the German word for guilt and debt are the same. Schuld, yes. Schuld, and, it's, and here he's talking about indebtedness. Yes. Um, are they cognates or completely, I was, you know, I was having associations with that and I was wondering if that was misplaced. Yeah, no, I, I think it's placed correctly. Yeah, I think he understands that. Yes, as, as, as death. Yes. Yeah. Or well, we understand as death. Yeah. Yeah, Great. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there is some work. Uh, there's a woman named uh, Melinda Corp Cooper. Uh, she's a, 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 she actually she was in Australia, Beryl, I think for a while. Life is Surplus is one of her books uh, on the biopolitical. Uh, she's done some work on Heidegger debt and political economy, Keynes and Heidegger. I mean, it's a, quite an imaginative project to be, you know, but, but anyway, she's, she's, uh, she's out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I know, I'm glad you brought that up, this whole German notion of the Schuld indebtedness. And, you know, this also works in terms of superego, as you know, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, the Schuld, right? What is owed? What is, what is demanded, right? In so many ways, yeah. Yeah, Carl, you wanted to say something? Oh, I just, yeah, Richard, it, it seemed to me that what you were saying was, is, is indebtedness, does it evoke something regarding guilt, right? And then is, is that what you were? You, you, well, yes, uh, is, I mean, uh, right. I mean, my understanding uh, was that uh, debt uh, and gu uh, guilt uh, are, uh, come from the same root in German. And so I was wondering about that in terms of the connection between indebtedness and causality that Heidegger is making here. Do, I, I, do, do you see there a link to guilt there in, in what he's arguing? I uh, I'm I, wondering I, about it. Hmm. And, and from what Michael is saying it leads me to think it's worth exploring further, I guess. 
I, I absolutely agree here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, the vocabulary and the German and the, the linkage that is are going on really makes a strong case for the relational, you know, aspects here. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I think it's best we see how he operates, you know, and, and uh, you know, kind of take it from there and, and maybe we can, uh, yeah. I mean, again, this, this to me is an example of, uh, first of all, the, 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 the destruction, if you will, of instrumental reason and philosophical anthropology early on. He's gonna go there first. But then you begin to see this dialogue taking place between the German, right? The ancient Greek and the displacement of the Latin and how the Latinates have confused us and are now only associated with veritas and correspondence theories of truth or adequate notions of truth versus that of Aletheia, which is his, basically his method is, you know, this presencing and coming forth, revealing is one of the translation, probably unconcealing is better, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as a term of the Aletheia logical. But anyway, why, why don't we start on the text and we'll take, unless Patrick, you wanted to say something, you're unmuted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, this is basically good digging into the text. Yeah. And the thing that I found fascinating was his discussion of Aristotle's, well, let's put this in quotes, Aristotle's four causes. Yes. And yeah. he makes a point that, well, I mean, to quote, this is on, on page eight. Yes. He says, the Aristotelian doctrine neither knows the cause that is named by the term, nor uses a Greek word that would correspond to it, referring to efficient cause. And I mean, I mean, most people who've been trained in philosophy know about where Aristotle's four causes. Yes. So what Heidegger is saying is that, no, the efficient cause in fact is not in Aristotle. And then he goes on to talk, basically give a very nuanced interpretation of the notion of efficient cause, which as he says, gathers together the three causes of material, formal, and final, yes. and that that, in fact, is the notion of efficient cause. Right. And going forward on page 11, actually 10, you know, he goes through, for what presences by means of physics has the bursting open belonging to bringing forth, for example, bursting of the blossom, et cetera, et cetera. In contrast, what is brought forth by the artisan or artist, for example, the silver chalice, has the bursting upon, bursting open belonging to the bringing forth, not in itself, but in another, in the craftsman or the artist. And what, I'm just, it kind of, it, it, I did a double take, you know, it kind of jarred me because I've always thought thought of these as basically being synonymous. I mean, other people with knowledge of the history, of, are we dealing here with a, a, a kind of Heideggerian reinterpretation of Aristotle? Yes. Or are we dealing with Heidegger actually having a much better understanding of the Greeks? And later on with the, in the Middle Ages with, with Aquinas, this shift takes place in terms of these four causes. Because with, with Heidegger, there's much more of a subjective dimension to this notion of causality in terms of efficient cause. Remember, I mean, I mentioned that the epochs of being, that the first epoch for of being for, for Heidegger is the one. The second going to Aquinas is natura. That's the Latinate. And just what you said kind of feeds the notion of the being. And then we get into this epoch of self-consciousness, of course, with this advented by Luther and Descartes, depending on which side of the, uh, you know, the, the uh, Alsace-Lorraine you are. But, uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, very, very good points. I mean, you know, the four material, the four uh, causes of Aristotle are being rethought here completely. And that Heidegger is really trying to, you know, engage the Greeks in a completely original way. And, mm -hmm. and as you said, you know, and uh, you know, you don't know, you notice he doesn't use language of prime mover at all. 
mm -hmm. which is interesting. He uses poesis and fusis right together. Yeah. That's another thing that he does that's very different, the poesis, et cetera. I probably have a different book. Uh, I was looking for the pages you were reading from. It was probably on a different page. Uh, I mean, just to, just to go back, this is on page, um, 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 page um, um, 10 in, in at least the Lovett uh, book. Uh, or you know the love and question concerning technology, and uh, it's, it's, but what? Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, oh, it's, that it's, one? okay. I must have missed yeah, the, the, yeah. the thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, you know because he goes it is utmost importance we think bringing forth in its full scope, right? And at the same time, in the sense in which the Greek thought it, right? The Greek thought it not only handicraft handcraft manufacture, not only artistic and poetical bringing into appearance and concrete imagery is a bringing forth poesis. Fusis, also the arising of something from out of itself is a bringing forth poesis. Fusis is indeed poesis in the highest sense. So we don't have this separation or this reflective activity. We have the highest sense of a poesis is fusis, nature, if you will. For what presence, by means of fusis, has the bursting open belonging to bringing forth the bursting of a blossom into bloom in itself, right? In contrast, what is brought forth by the artisan of the artist, the silver chalice, has the bursting open belonging to bringing forth, not in itself, but in another, in the craftsman or in the artist, right? Very interesting here, you know, going back to what you said about agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard, yeah. Well, I, I have some thoughts about the Greek words uh, and how he translates them, but right. um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure now's the time or if it's better to wait until we get to them uh, in the text. Um, okay. Patrick, did you want to say something else? I mean, a very insightful, uh, you know, moment there about the, uh, you know, the Heideggerian, uh, you know, attempt at rethinking the Greeks and Aristotle, especially here, where the efficient cause is not just one of the list, right? It becomes much more, yeah. And also is rethinking of telos too, not yeah. as aim or object or objective either, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which actually leaves us open in telos. You know, a lot of people talk about teleological closure or telos as, as the, you know, et cetera. But in a way, Heidegger leaves the open telos in a sense, right? <laughs> the open-endedness, yeah, of something, yeah. But please, go ahead, Patrick, I'm sorry, yeah. I oh, don't, no, not, not much else. I mean, I, I just was fascinated with that. I mean, but the other thing too is that it is, it's really not about, bringing something it's it it's more than simply bringing something into existence mm -hmm. it's the way in which it's reflected into within the, the act of labor itself that i think heidegger brings out okay and um you know when he says in that paragraph that you and i read but in another in the craftsman or the artist right so that that's that's a fast I mean, too often we see labor as just something that it's just a matter of, of an object which is created. We don't realize the way in which it's reflected in the act of labor itself within right. the person who works. Right. You know? right. And, uh, you know, it's, it, and it's like, it's, it's, you know, this kind of touches on, you know, Marx's notion of, of living labor. Um, yeah, that, so very good point. Again, that, you know, this is that. something that, that, I mean, obviously that, that Marcuse picks up on in terms of his, the way in which he thinks of labor. So, yes, yes. Okay, Douglas, and then back to Richard. Yeah, um, just a very quick, quick point. One person I don't think you've brought up, at least not today, is Ernst Jünger. And I, I think a lot of Jünger's work around the 30s, especially in the book, uh, I think in German, it's Uber de Linie, uh, dealing with oh, the oh, idea oh, of boundaries oh, and oh, dealing oh, with the yeah. grenza and the boundaries. Yeah. And obviously you have Jünger's idea of mass mobilization and the war. And do you see the fingerprints of Jünger in this well, text? Throughout the, throughout he doesn't the, mention, I don't think he doesn't mention Jünger here. Well, he has many conversations with Jünger and there, there are references to Jünger before. Yeah, I mean, Jünger is the leading representative, if you will, of conservative revolution, the warrior intellectual, 
yeah. right? In some ways. I mean, Junger is, is absolutely crucial. And the whole the book, Total Mobilization, uh, yeah. as well as the worker, Der Arbeiter, is, yeah. is, is a very, very important work that feeds Heidegger. And I think what living labor that, that Patrick was talking about, that both Junger and Marx have that in mind. They're much more, they're much closer to each other. You know, Junger was much, much of a national Bolshevik in some ways. You know, yeah. not an international yeah. Bolshevik, but he was a national Bolshevik, which is kind yeah. of interesting in, in a sense, right? And uh, very influential on Heidegger. And on the line that you mentioned is actually re, uh, re, uh, re-inscribed by uh, Deleuze and Guattari and on the line and uh, later in Mill Plateau, by the way. They, they, okay. they revisit that. But on the line is, you know, Junger wants to cross it. Heidegger wants to study it. <laughs> and that may be the difference between the two right there. One wants to look at the circumscription, right? And the right. limit, if you yeah, will, yeah. of the line. Whereas Junger says, no, we're going to cross it, the danger, right? In a way. And remember, Junger was part of bunker bunker uh, warfare, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Further. And he went after, you know, he had he was part of the group to take out Hitler, too. You know, he was part well, of Well, there's it. a whole whole constellation of yeah moments, data points, and technology. I never read this essay before in terms of that earlier work, but it, it's, it has to really be inscribed yes. within that yes. period. And it yeah, makes it a bit more dangerous, I think, as well, to read it in that way. Uh, I agree so. with you. Uh, total mobilization is worth reading, and it's very <laughs> applicable to today. You know, I, um, I mentioned Lazzarato earlier. Uh, he has I'll a book, war, war and, Wars and Capital, a new book with Eric Allier's, um, you know, another a uh, student of uh, Deleuze, right? And they've, they've coordinated on this. This is a rethink, rethinking, mm-hmm. if you will, of the aspect of total mobilization. And, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, Junger's text like this really anticipates, uh, you know, wars and revolution everywhere. You know, he understood this very much as an aspect yeah. of modernity, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah, in many ways. Richard, go ahead. Yeah, please. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, um, I yeah. just, uh, maybe it's because I was, taught Greek uh, by uh, people who uh, fled, Germans who fled the Holocaust. But, you know, I was kind of uh, always taught to be a little suspicious of German, German Greek. And I have to say, you know, it's like, and it comes back to me because it's very, you know, at times there, there are choices that Heidegger makes that are very, you know, willful. For example, now techne, the verb from which techne comes, uh, you know, we, we have a, the, the uh, is the word for birth, right? I mean, ticto means I give birth. So, right. and somehow that's completely missed. And it seems so obvious. It seems just outside the frame here. We have Nate, but of course that would bring in gender. And, you know, I, I remember once, for some a zine writing on Heidegger and on this essay and um, on Alien, uh, you know, um, and the film Alien, and you know, I still don't. Which was great, really cool pop culture, but it, you know, it still is. It's interesting the whole thing about bringing forth techne uh, and its relation to Tikto, you know, uh, which seems. I mean, we have it. It's interesting, the word labor, right? I mean, we, a woman goes into labor. Uh, so this, this connection between uh, birth and technology uh, is, is one that you know, we have in English. I don't know anything. I haven't given it much thought beyond that, but it's, it's, it's an interesting connection given the Greeks and you know their notion of birth. They thought of that the that the uh, that the male seed was the child, and that the uterus only was a kind of vessel, which in which the uh, the uh, seed, the male seed, created the child. There was no DNA, or there was no relation. The feminine was merely a, a receptacle. So it's you know, it's, it's interesting. And then the other thing is Aletheia. You know, like Aletheia comes from the river Lethe, right? Yeah. 
And yeah. the main, and the main, so, and the, you know, this is the part of the Odyssey, for example, that Pound yeah. translates and makes the first canto and is thought by yeah. scholars to be the oldest part of the um, Odyssey. Uh, and so it's, it's, so there, if you, th and he, and he doesn't mention the alpha privative for some reason that it's, you know, that truth is not leafy, you know, so I'm, you know, so it, so it would mean either not, not to be forgotten or that which cannot be forgotten, you know, uh, or, or shouldn't be forgotten, but that all is, you know, disappears in Heidegger and is replaced by this idea of unconcealing which I can understand in terms of if you think of well in the in the uh, in the Odyssey, uh, which becomes the first book of the Cantos, you you dig a pit. Um, so so it's the undigging that reveals. So it's it's um, so you could say unburied um, as bringing forth, but still it's you know again there there seems to be um, a lot of uh, possibilities in the Greek that don't serve Heidegger. So he just kind of, you know, we, maybe it's fine. You know, maybe that's what you have to do. You have to be yeah. willful. Yeah. Um, if I could just make a remark about Aletheia or Lethe uh, in a way, uh, you know, being in time is really about the forgetting of the question of being. Right, and it's that forgetting in structural lethe that is really part of that book, right? <laughs> in a way, the design and the pull down to everydayness and all of these things are a journey through structural lethe. You know, Heidegger is a proto-structuralist in that book. You know, I, I want to point that out, and I think he's very well aware of the alpha primitive because he is really talking about this forgetting, for, you know. For, forgottenness of this, right, in many ways. And then this becomes a model for, I mean, a, a, a kind of lever of interpretation that really the presencing and absencing, the unconcealing, concealing always is, you know, operative in terms of any kind of investigation into phenomena, right, in a sense, all right? So I, I just want to point that out. It's not that he denies, you know, lethe or, or structural lethe or the alpha primitive, uh, it, it's it, it's part of the forgetting that he understands all too well. There was a debate about his interpretive stuff between him and and a very good scholar. Uh, I think his name was Paul Friedrich, uh, you know, a, a linguist philosopher on on the interpretation of Aletheia. And I'll see if I can find it for you, you know, because it's interesting because, you know, he ultimately, Friedrich comes back and says to Heidegger, yes, I think you were right the way you used it, you know, even though they were in a debate in the beginning. But, you know, for whatever it's worth, I'm not expert enough on the ancient Greek to know exactly, you know, and, and again, I don't think Heidegger's any purist here either, right, in, in a sense, and yeah, yeah. And, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, you know, uh, your Greek teachers were Straussians, right, in some ways, was it, so uh, we're, we're, yeah. Oh, oh, only, uh, only one. Bernadetti. Okay. Better yeah. daddy. The rest yeah. were not. The rest were. Uh, okay. Not. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well Strauss was a, a student of Heidegger too, <laughs> right? In a sense, right? So I'm. Listen again. I, I'm not. I'm not good enough to to know whether you know he's really pristine here, right? <laughs> if it's completely clear in a way. But I mean, I think there there's obviously. No, yeah, that was a good answer. Yeah, I no, you but, helped. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So maybe we can maybe go to the text and see this at work and Richard can uh, fill in the correctives at time. Carl, you want to say something before we go to the text? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was I was going to ask a question about uh, 9, 10 and 11. So but I could wait if, if you want to. Um... OK, well, why don't, why don't we just go through? I, I think the introductions fairly clear, you know, uh, he, he, you know, typical Heideggerian style in, so being in, first of all, what follows, <laughs> right? Being in, what follows will be, shall be questioning concerning technology, not just the question, but questioning 
concerning technology. Questioning builds away. We would be advised, therefore, above all, to pay heed. And I guess he means by that, listen. You know, he has this great uh, phrase for bestimmung, attunement, you know, determination, but really attunement, right? And not to fix our attention on isolated sentences and topics. And I've always liked this about Heidegger. I also like this about Marx. It's the process of the reading that takes place. Don't really just fix on one little passage. You know, the typical graduate school, you know, postdoc thing. I'm going to take this little item and I'm going to write a long essay about it. isolated sentences that someone said this somewhere. You know, I, I really like this about him. Don't fix on sentences and topics. Just like uh, Gramsci in the beginning of the study of philosophy mentioned one should look at language as a totality, not isolated words and phrases, right? And think of it as a whole, right? In, in many ways. And, you know, so the, the way is a way of thinking. So again, we're in this moment of, you know, in Heidegger's one of his more famous essays post-World War II is the end of philosophy and the task of thinking. The philosophy has come to a close, closure, and it's now time for the task of thinking. All right, all manners of thinking, more or less perceptively, lead through language in a matter that is extraordinary. We shall be questioning concerning technology, and in so doing, we should like to prepare a free relationship to it. So the propedeutic is to kind of free up, liberate, right, our, our previous thinking about it. The relationship will be free if it opens our existence to the essence of technology. So this is what he does here, you know, early on, if we open ourselves, you know, uh, to this uh, relationship to the essence of technology. When we can respond to this essence, we shall be able to experience the technological within its own bounds. So again, we're going to circumscribe a space, you know, there is this circumscription that is going on. So this is very interesting, the first proposition, technology is not equivalent to the essence of technology. When we are seeking the essence of tree, we have to become aware that that which pervades every tree as tree is not itself a tree that can be accounted among all the other trees. Likewise, the essence of technology is by no, no means anything technological. Thus, we shall never experience our relationship to the essence of technology as long as we merely conceive and push forward the technological, put up with it or evade it. Everywhere we remain unfree and changed to technology, whether we passionately either affirm or deny it. But we are delivered over to it in the worst possible way when we regard it as something neutral. For the conception of it, to which today we particularly like to do homage, makes us utterly blind to the essence of technology. And you know how the, the vernacular goes, it's the technology, man, you know, or, you know, it's, it's the technology doing it, right, et cetera. All right, so according to ancient doctrine, and of course he's referring to the Greeks, the essence of a thing is considered to be what the thing is, the whatness, you know, it's quotidian. We ask the question concerning technology and we ask what it is. Everyone knows the two statements that answer our question. One says, and this is really wonderful, I think, this beginning, technology is a means to an end. Yeah, yeah, in many ways, the instrumental, right? Technology is a human activity. The two definitions of technology belong together, it's both. For us to point, posit, excuse me, ends and procure and utilize the means to them is a human activity. The manufacture and utilization of equipment, tools, machines, the manufactured and used things themselves and the needs and ends that they serve all belong to what technology is. The whole complex of these contrivances, and he uses the Latinate, right, is technology. Technology itself is a contrivance or in Latin, an instrumentum. And very interesting use of contrivance, right, alongside instrumental reasoning. You know, you can see the Frankfurt School at work here too, the instrumental reason, the critique of instrumental reason. Okay, the current conception of technology according to which is a means, um, to which it is a means in the human activity can therefore be the instrumental and the anthropological definition of technology. 
This is what he's going to really want to get away from. So he's setting the, the table again. Who would ever deny that it is correct? It is an obvious conformity to what we are envisioning when we talk about technology. The instrumental definition of technology is indeed so uncannily correct that it even holds for modern technology of which in other respects, we remain with some justification. We maintain with some justification that it is in contrast to the older handwork technology. Yeah, something completely different and therefore new. Even the power plant with its turbines and generators is a man-made means to an end established by men. Even the jet aircraft and the high frequency apparatuses are means to ends. A radar station is of course less simple than a weather vane. To be sure the construction of a high frequency apparatus requires the interlocking of various processes of technical industrial production. And certainly a sawmill in a secluded valley of the Black Forest is a primitive means compared with a hydroelectric plant in the Rhine River. But this much remains correct. Modern technology too is a means to an end. That is why the instrumental conception of technology conditions every attempt and conditions is also very important here. Um, you know, it's probably Bestimmung. I, I haven't looked at the German, but it probably determines every attempt to bring man into the right relationship to technology relation to. Everything depends on our manipulating technology in the proper manner as a means. We will, as we say, get technology spiritually in hand. We will master it. The will to mastery becomes all the more urgent, the more technology threatens to slip from control. You know, when we can see this with the pandemic at work, you know, the mad rush, you know, towards, you know, finding the magic uh, vaccine, the magic pill, the magic formulas, et cetera, this rush, 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 right, et cetera. So Heidegger takes the step back, but suppose now with technology, we're no more mere means, how would it stand with the will to master it? You know, so he throws into question this whole instrumental reason of means to ends, and what if it's not that? And you know, what, how will it stand with the will to mastery if it's not instrumental? Yet we said, did we not, that the instrumental definition of technology is correct, question mark, to be sure. But the correct, and this is good, I think, you know, this also plays with the aletheia. The correct always forces, fo focuses, or fixes, excuse me, upon something pertinent in whatever is under consideration. However, in order to be correct, this fixing by no means needs to uncover the thing in the question in its essence, what Patrick had replied to earlier in terms of the labor involved too, or the bringing forth and the act. Right? Only at this point where such an uncovering happens does the true come to pass. For that reason, the merely correct is not yet the true. Only the true brings us into a free relationship with that which concerns us from out of its essence. Accordingly, the correct instrumental definition of technology still does not show us technology's essence. We cannot get to the, the essence. In order that we may arrive at this, or at least come close, we must seek the true by the way of the correct. We must ask, what is the instrumental itself? Within what do things as means and end belong? A means is that whereby something is effected and thus attained. And this is interesting again, where the means comes back to the efficient cause uh, later with uh, Heidegger's reading of the Aristotelian four causes. Whoever, whatever has an effect as its consequence is called a cause, but not only by means of which something else is affected as a cause, the end in keeping with which the kind of means to be used is determined is also considered a cause. Whenever, excuse me, wherever ends are pursued and means are employed, wherever instrumentally reigns, there reigns causality. So the interesting thing, the whole history of Western philosophical thinking about causality is being thrown into question here, right? Where instrumentality reigns, there reigns causality and in instrumental reason. Every time we think in terms of means and ends, right, et cetera, yeah? And some of you know Hume and the billiard ball. 
right? <laughs> so, you know, we can, we can go there too. So for century, philosophy has taught us, and this is of course a, a, an elementary review of the Aristotelian uh, causes. Of course, the formal, the matter out of which, I like the violin better, the wood that becomes the violin <laughs> that plays the music for us, you know, it's supposed to bring us pleasure to the ears, but anyway. So the, the number three, the causes finalis, the end, for exactly the sacrificial rite in relation to which the chalice required is determined as to its form and manner. And then the efficient cause, which brings about the effect that the finished actual chalice in this instance, the silversmith, right? What technology is when represented as a means, and this is important, careful with the language, the what technology is when represented as a means discloses itself when we trace instrumentality back to fourfold causality. But suppose yeah, that causality for its part is veiled in darkness with respect to what it is. And this is typical, you know, we're shrouded in darkness, right? We have forgotten this question of being. We have forgotten the meaning of being. Again, certainly for centuries, we have acted as though the doctrine of the four causes had fallen from heaven is a truth as clear as daylight. <laughs> but it might be that the time has come to ask, why are there just four causes, right? In relation to the aforementioned four, what does cause really mean? For whence did it come that the causal character of the four causes is so unified, unif um, um, fidly, um, determined that they belong together? So long as we do not allow ourselves to go into these questions, causality and with it instrumentality, and with the latter, the accepted definition of technology remain obscure and groundless, right? Very important. The instrumental version of causality, instrumental reason is, is groundless. This is Heidegger, I think it is best. For a long time, we have been accustomed to representing cause as that which brings something about. That which brings something about. In this connection, to bring about means to obtain results, effects. The cause is efficient, but one among the four causes sets the standard for all causality. This goes so far that we no longer even count the final cause, telic finality as causality. Causa, casus, belongs to the verb caderi, to fall, right? And means that which brings it about, something falls out as a result in such and such a way, right? Yeah. The doctrine of the four causes goes back to Aristotle, but everything that later ages seek in Greek thought under the conception and rubric causality in the realm of Greek thought and for Greek thought per se has simply nothing at all to do with bringing about and effecting. Typical Heidegger, again, the strategy to say the tradition has completely missed this original Greek, you know, meaning, right? And this is where we are, you know, this is what's been handed down. You know, remember, this is someone that had the, the small-minded attempt to rewrite the history of Western ontology, right? So this is, you know, someone that's not, you know, saying, I'm just making a few remarks here. I'm agreeing to disagree. This is a, you know, a revolutionary rethinking of the entire history of philosophy and, and, and an encounter with it. You know, and a very violent one, as Richard probably can attest to when we get to some of the Greek terms. Well, we can, we can speak about maybe that violence, that violence that's done to the language. What we call cause, and he uses the German ursaka, you know, primary uh, uh, matter, if you will, and the Romans call causa, is called etion by the Greeks, to that which something else is indebted, to go back to where we began with the schuld, et cetera. <coughs> um, yeah, verschulder, verschulder, right, is the verb there. The four causes are the ways, all belonging at once to each other, of being responsible for something else. An example can clarify this, right? And then he gives the, the long example of the silver. You want to stop here, Richard? You want to say yeah. something about this, uh, you know, in terms of the Greek, the, the way he uses etion, um, you know, and, um, and then, of course, uh, you know, what you mentioned earlier about the indebtedness. Uh, yeah. 
I mean, I can go on, but you know, if you want to, you know, make a remark about uh, this, because again, remember Heidegger is is thinks that the Latin is a major corruption of the Greek, and one of the attempts here is to go back to a more, if you will, originary meaning, an Ursprung meaning, if you will, of the Greek, and saying that this is what has set us into this metaphysical nihilism that we've got through the Latinate uses of these terms and how we have interpreted, you know, the history of philosophy, et cetera, and where we are. Yeah, Richard, please, yeah, yeah. No, I uh, I, uh, I don't really have something about that, uh, but uh, I'll just say that I was starting to think about, you know, in terms of, in terms of this idea of the forgetting of being, of the yeah. question of being, uh, and the term aletheia, it's, it's very interesting in terms of, you know, I was thinking about forgetting for Freud and, uh, and you know, the, the idea of the unconscious and what's in a way repressed and remembered. So as if, you know, for me, I have floating around in my head, these two different notions that, of a, you know, how is the alpha primitive? Is it, is it is that it um, shouldn't be forgotten and it's been forgotten? That would be Heidegger. And then Freud would be that it's been for, you know, not the same thing as being, but that, that, the, that the truth is somehow can be repressed, but it, re, but it returns. You know, it's, it's in a way a slightly more, and maybe I'm, I, you know, I, well, it's maybe an I'm- moment there, you know, both, both use repetition, right? <laughs> in a right. way of retrieval, if you will, right? I mean, the repetition of the working through in the Freudian uh, sense, right? And of course, in the Heideggerian sense, the Vider Holung of the whole hauling of the past and that repeating of working through the tradition too, right? So yeah, I think you're on to something here. I mean, it's very good, you know, connection, you know, the, the remembering, the forgetting are very important. And you know, there's a seminal essay by Adorno called Working Through the Past, you know? <laughs> after Auschwitz, right? He, uh, part of a, a group of things he did, education after Auschwitz and working through the past, in which you know, th this comes up too, remembering and forgetting, right, in many ways. And of course, this is in the Platonic dialogue, what is the difference between memory and active recollection, anonymous, right? And what, what does this have to do with the quote, the Freudian remembering of the working through or the Heideggerian, you know, uh, repetition too. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I can see the connections, you know, uh, you know, uh, I mean, but you know, Heidegger is not, you know, is not presupposing the unconscious. He's seeing this as a philosophical problem. You know, this is more of a, a you know, a positing of, a, you know, a philosophical set of issues that have gotten us into the quote shipwreck of the 20th century or the the malaise that we're all all facing. Yeah, Carl, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, I'll try to work through this. I mean, we're going to spend two weeks on this. It's very good and dense. Yeah, that, yeah that's good <clears throat> because I, I, yeah, so. Like if we just take this paragraph, you know, that that has like I would be interested in hearing other people's understanding of this distinction he's making, because he's sort of saying, you know, we have this way of thinking cause X causes Y X brings Y about. Right. And then he's saying that he's counterposing this to Y being indebted to X. And in one way, you know, like, I, I mean, maybe this is a very superficial reading, you know, you could say, well, th those are, that's two ways of saying the same thing, right? The, but then what is Y that is in debt? So X seems to be in some sense, you know, there is an agent, there is, you know, in, it seems in this context, right? But then why would you say Y is indebted to X and what, so, so, you know, the example I was using was, you know, thinking about a salad, right? I go make it my, you know, my evening salad, right? And so I cause the salad to come into being, and you could do an Aristotelian reading of that. There's material form and purpose to feed me, et cetera. Um, 
to say that the salad that I make and then eat is indebted to me seems rather unusual. So again, you know, I, I feel like a lot with Heidegger, you have to really slow down. He, he makes all these sort of moves. And I find like it's not always clear to me what he's really doing, right? So, so this seems like a good point where he's making one of these. I mean, this is kind of a clear move that he's making that's going to open up a very different way of talking about cause and essentially doing away with causality as such. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, uh, uh, Richard. Yeah, you're going to. Right. Well, two things. One is, I uh, I wish, uh, you know, whenever, sometimes when you bring up the Greek and you're waiting for me to, uh, 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 you know, kind of uh, say more, I, I, it makes me aware of how little I know for, you know, for all the time I spent doing Greek. And I'd love to hear what you have in mind, yeah. uh, because I probably am not familiar with it. Right. But, you know, I yeah. will say that Antioch, <laughs> Antioch, the Greek, this, you know, originally means um, the person who's accused of something is, you know, the, the guilty party. So it does have, uh, you know, this, uh, this sense uh, of uh, causality in the sense of a trial. You know, it, I think it, it's actually a term that is first a legal term um, and then becomes a term that's used uh, by Aristotle, which of course, uh, you know, is 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 later uh, uh, to be causality, but it, it originates as a legal term, uh, so that Carl would be guilty of making that salad. You know, yeah. Yeah. we would right. find him guilty of that salad. Right. <laughs> right. But he, but but he's he's yeah, but he's, he's using it in a different way. And it seems that yeah. he then, you know, not to jump ahead, but he then moves actually fairly quickly to sort of another displacement or move where it's being reframed as to induce or to occasion. Right? Well, he doesn't talk about inducement. You know, he's trying to stay out of that kind of Cartesian and, uh, you know, more traditional uh, philosophical language. But with, occasion well, is something no. he's really speaking about, modes of occasion instead of modes of production, if you want to look at it that way. Or, you know, mode, modes of, uh, of uh, occasioning. Yeah. Well, I mean, I Richard's really on to something here, though, in the sense that Heidegger, I think, is very aware of the legal definition, right, that is being used here. And, you know, you could think of this in terms of, you know, the cause as being related to, you know, he's thinking relationally here. I mean, this is a crucial passage. I think we have a hard time to think relationally because we're too much, you know, in some senses, either positivist Marxists or, or we are always thinking, you know, we want to get to the, to the essence quickly of something. But he says, the four causes are the ways all belonging at once to each other of being responsible for something else. And, you know, he goes on to this thing. So he's always thinking in these relational terms. And I think, you know, by looking at Etion as a, as a legal term, is a very important thing. I mean, Adorno speaks about this, by the way, um, you know, and, and Richard, I don't know if you know this, but in the critique of uh, Metacritique of Knowledge, you know, his book called Against Epistemology, he speaks about the legal language of Husserl and phenomenology in the German. So the German legal language and its relationship to the Greek legal language is very important here in many ways. These are not foolish people. Remember, you know, this is serious stuff. This is 1955, post-World War II Germany, but also during, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, total mobilization of the 30s in various ways, you know, with the Junger, Junger and uh, others, you know, and we, we all know, you know, uh, what went on. So, but anyway, I, I think it's very important to go back to that in this also notion of we're guilty, right? <laughs> you know, as Alta said, what are we guilty of? You know, he says this in Reading Capital, we're guilty of being philosophers. 
you know, we're, we're guilty by this, not in the sense of the original sin that Fichte takes up or, you know, all these kind of things, but just the guilty, you know, really in a sense, the, uh, the notion of der process in German, you know, the trial, we're always process is a trial. Yeah, anyway, yeah, so go ahead, Patrick, please. Oh, I'm yeah, go, go, just real, real quick, um, go on. I, I also, I found, I found a PDF of the German and, and read it carefully and Schuld, I mean, is, I mean, debt is debt, but he also uses co-responsibility as Mitschuld, which is a reflexive form in yeah. terms of, of, of what's going on here. Right. So it's a relationship, I mean, in terms of philosophy, I mean, in terms of subject and object. The subject is constituted in the way in which it basically brings the object into the world. And that's what he's, he's playing with here, these different levels of causality. Right. And I think that that's something to keep in mind. But go ahead, Carl. Good. Yeah, oh. and in a way, the subject is very interesting because you begin to see the French in some ways that Heidegger has a point. <laughs> you know, the translation of German metaphysics into French is French philosophy in the 20th century. You yeah. think about Foucault and subject and subjection and all these, the sujet, right, in so many ways. How legalistic this, how legal it is, and this, what you said, this correlationality that's going on between subject and object. So, yeah, very good. Yeah. What did you want to say, Carl? I mean, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, not to jump ahead, but uh, that on page nine, there's this, uh, you know, he talks about the four ways now being, he's now talking about it as being responsible. The four ways of being responsible bring something into appearance. They let it come forth into presence, think, they set it free. And then a little bit later, he actually, and then he says the principal characteristic of being responsible is just starting something on its way into arrival. It is in the sense of such a starting something on its way into arrival that being, is re being responsible is an occasioning or an inducing to go forward. Which seems to me like, I mean, that's how I would think X causes Y. I go make my salad, right? That, that seems to fit. I, if I am, if the salad is indebted to me, and then therefore I could be acute. Uh, how, how, how did we get the, the salad? If the, what did Richard say? The salad is indebted to me that I could be found guilty of making the salad Is right he, he left to get his uh feta cheese michael <laughs> yeah, yeah, Josh, I, yeah i just think that the that there is some there is some importance to the example that he gives here this the uh silver. this it's silver very, chalice yeah. is a yeah. is the oh, communion yeah. chalice essentially <laughs> No, but it's, a, it's the it's the communion chalice is what he's talking yeah, about here. Exactly, so, exactly. So, so, you know, it's not just a salad. It's like you're calling something that has all the symbolic and sort of metaphorical, you know, existence into 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 presence, you know, like there there's some real intentionality behind the object uh, here that he that he's pointing to, I think, you know, uh, that kind of informs this whole idea of Causality. A very good example of this whole thing of indebtedness and the Schulden and the yeah. co-relationship co that Patrick referred to. Silver is that which out of the silver chalice is made. As this matter, he lay, right, you lay, it is co-responsible for the chalice. The chalice is indebted to, i.e., owes thanks to, right, interesting, owes thanks to, that is owing thanks, very interesting, right, in many ways to the silver for that out of which it consists. But the sacrificial vegetable is indebted not only to the silver as a chalice, that which is indebted to the silver appears in the aspect of a chalice and not in that of a bro bro brooch or a, a ring, a brooch or a ring. Thus the sacrificial vessel is at the same time indebted to the aspect, the idos, you know, the eidetic reduction of chaliceness, right? This is the eidetic reduction at work, phenomenologically. But both the silver into which the aspect is admitted, right, as chalice, and the aspect in which the silver appears are in their respective ways co-responsible 
for the sacrificial vessel. This is a very, I mean, I think this is a very concrete example, but there remains yet a third that is above all, above all responsible for the sacrificial vessel. It is that which in advance, which in advance confines the chalice within the realm of consecration and bestowal. Through this, the chalice is circumscribed as sacrificial vessel. vessel. Circumscribing gives bounds to the thing, the third moment, right? Circumscribing. With the bounds, the thing does not stop. Rather, from out of them, it begins to be what? After production, it will be. That which gives bounds, that which completes in the sense is called in Greek, telos. Very interesting. On the line with Junger is the telos in this sense. You know, this line. Are we going to cross? What, what does on the line mean, really, ultimately? Yeah, often translated as aim or purpose, and so misinterpreted. The telos is responsible for what as matter and for what as aspect are together co-responsible. And finally, there is a fourth participant in the responsibility of the finished sacrificial vessels lying before us ready for use. That is the silversmith. Right, but not at all because he in working brings about the finished sacrificial uh, chalice, as it were, the effect of a making. The silversmith smith is not a cause, an efficient cause. The Aristotelian doctrine neither knows the cause that is named by this term nor uses a Greek word that would correspond to it. And he goes on. I mean, this is interesting because again, this is a rereading of book six of the Nicomachean Ethics, as well as a, a rereading of Aristotle's physics, especially the fourth book. The silversmith considers carefully and gathers together the three aforementioned uh, ways of being responsible and indebted. And this is interesting, responsible and indebted. To consider carefully is in Greek, legin, legin, logos. Legging is rooted in apophanastai, right? Bringing forth into appearance, right? The aphanasis, right? Which Lacan uses, uh, I think, many times in uh, the four fundamental uh, concepts of psychoanalysis. He uses this. this one. The silversmith is co-responsible as that from whence the sacrificial vestibules bringing forth and resting in self take and retain their first departure. The three previously mentioned ways of being responsible owe thanks to the pondering of the silversmith for the that and the how of their coming into appearance and into play for the production of the sacrificial uh, vessel. These thus four ways of being responsible, this is interesting, of being responsible, no longer causality, right? <laughs> Holt's sway in the sacrificial vessel that lies ready before us. They differ from one another, yet they belong together. What unites them from the beginning, what, what, what unites them from the beginning? In what does this plane in unison of the four ways of being resemble play? What is the source of the unity, right, of the four causes? What, after all, does this owing and being responsible mean? Thought as the Greeks thought it. Today, we're too easily inclined. Again, this dismantling that's going on either to understand being responsible and being indebted moralistically as a lapse or else to construe them in terms of effecting. In either case, we bar to ourselves the way to the primal meaning, the primordial meaning, probably is better, of that which is later called causality. So long as this way is not opened up to us, we shall also fail to see what instrumentality, which is based on causality, actually is. So th this is where he's going. Again, this path through the Greek, right? <laughs> In a very different way against, again, the Latinate and trying to read. Yeah, Richard, please. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just, it also reminds me what you were just reading, uh, starting really with what Patrick was saying, but it reminds me of the, uh, the middle voice. You know, Greek has a middle voice, uh, which is about, you know, we have active passive. There's a whole voice that Greek has uh, that disappears. Um, and, you know, the middle voice is about a special relationship of the subject to the object. It's about that the subject is conscious of an action uh, in relation, in its, you know, I, I, I just have Smythe, which my better daddy, daddy once told me is the only good 
uh, Greek grammar and English. Uh, Michael, I happen to have it right here. Okay. <laughs> and it says, as contrasted with the active, the middle lay stress on the conscious activity, bodily or mental uh, participation of the agent. The conscious activity, bodily or mental uh, participation of the agent. So, you know, so there's, you know, if you think of that or you think of the optative as well, um, suddenly um, it makes me kind of aware of, of something in Greek that he seems to be drawing attention to, which is very interesting. <laughs> yes, and also you can maybe think of this too as the middle voice is the siren song too, you know, in terms of earlier Greek, you know, yes. epic poem, poem as the siren song, of which, by the way, one of the most beautiful essays I've ever read on this kind of matter is Maurice Blanchot's on the siren song and the, the infinite conversation. Very beautiful on uh, huh. the siren the song of the siren in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Odyssey, right? Yeah, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous essay. Yeah, yeah, put it mildly, yeah. And, you know, uh, another another collaborator to a degree, but not not fully, right? So it goes to show you sometimes, but, but, but anyway, yeah. So um, anyway, uh, um, you know, any, uh, Carl, is this, is this uh, becoming a little, I mean, I'm trying to. Right. That that's the thing. The process. Yes, I, you know, how he gets I, to where he gets. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel a lot when I read this. It's very enjoyable to read. Um, I I think, and uh, there's a kind of, but I'm I'm sometimes not always so convinced of that his point of departure and then where he seems the various points he's arriving at sometimes it's not clear to me has he really unveiled something new or is he rhetorically kind of rebaptizing what the page before he called something else mm -hmm. and you know so so I I I will just you know express right. you know, I I'm, I'm not you know a Heideggerian, obviously, um, right. but so so it, it's it's that. I mean, and and but I'm also just you know asking that as a genuine question. So he starts on page seven with you know how we typically think of cause, and where he sort of ends up in this section. If you you know that paragraph is the one, you know the principal characteristic is starting something on its way into a rival. Being responsible is an occasioning or an inducing to go forward, right? So, so he's moved from, and, and it's interesting, he's moved from representing cause as that which brings something about. This is on page seven. And then by the bottom of page nine, he's arriving at as an occasioning or do, inducing to go forward. Right. But I mean, I, I right. think... Just, I think what we're just, doing, unfortunately, here, right? yeah, yeah, no, I understand, but I think unfortunately, vis-a-vis -vis Heidegger, in some ways, there's a different way of reading him that is not to take what he said previously, but again to follow the the the, the process and the and the the thinking as it as it unfolds, right? In a sense, I mean, he warned us in the beginning about taking the sentences and topics from the past. Right. Again, he's trying to make a case that this is what he's, you know, he's warning against this kind of reading. Again, this is an exercise in a different form of reading. I disagree that I, I mean, maybe I'm doing that, but I, I'm trying to follow his thought. I mean, he's, yeah. he's a, it's a questioning unfolding something. And I'm, I'm trying to understand what what is ultimately I mean, throughout the whole essay, it's an unfolding. There's, there's, yeah. there's a movement. There, and, and that's that's it's not like what does this word mean relative but what is the movement what is the passage that that's that's the question i'm asking it's not you know to sort of isolate this sentence so right I'm, yeah I, i'm not saying i mean i'm saying that again he's only at the point right now where he's really saying that the latinate notion of causality and the traditional approaches to causality are being thrown completely into question Right? right, and we're trying to get beyond that right now. We have not yet gotten into the question, 
you know, we're building a path towards questioning what is technology, right? <laughs> what and what then is its relation to the root techne, you know, technique, et cetera, et cetera, as we go forward. David, yeah, go, yeah, yeah, please. Um, yeah, yeah, I just, uh, um, so uh, a lot of confusion sort of, I think part of the confusion is uh, that we um, have a tendency, especially uh, like being new to Heidegger because Heidegger like lays out so many definitions and he does so very carefully. Once you get used to reading it, you know, like the, the, like, the recapitulation of what just happened is like very systematic in fact, right? Like, first of all, he builds definitions so that like by the time we get to in framing, in framing as a concept will sort of contain a whole bunch of other stuff that he's like building along the way. So that's why we're getting sort of pieces of this. So it's, it is, it's confusing as hell. Like the third or fourth time you read it when you know what's coming next, you know, it starts to get like clearer, but it, it really is like a slog and you don't know what's coming next or what to expect because he is like building these, not exactly new concepts, right? And this is my, my second point is that like, he's very careful about saying, um, I'm using no, like we're using no instrumental or anthropological definitions here. So insofar as we hear debt and think like, you know, something owed to someone for something, like we're in the wrong realm here already. We're like instrumentalizing and anthropologic, anthropologizing like debt immediately. So like when we think of debt the way that he's using it, it's, it's not the way that we're used to thinking of it at all. And it becomes this like constellation that includes responsibility. And that includes like this, this calling forth that's like still sort of like difficult to understand exactly. But the point of all that, right, is that it's not an instrumental or like, like moralistic, as he says, right? Like don't take debt in this way and then use it to think like somebody owes somebody something in this situation that needs to be paid back or something like that. Like, it's like, it can't be here except for this. But in that moment, like there's a responsibility that's also like a co-responsibility. So there's not exactly a debt paid to anyone in the way that we would think of like, you owe me something now, right? So like, but all of that only begins to make sense, I think after he introduces like what in framing is and we get through all that. And so like the building of these concepts is this extraordinarily difficult the first time through. And like, once you know what to anticipate and where he's going to, and like what to avoid ourselves, it becomes a little bit easier because it's of course, and I'll stop right here. It's of course our re reflex to say, yeah, but like debt and like responsibility, like I know what that means. And like, how the hell does that apply to this? You know? And Heidegger would say exactly like, no, that doesn't apply to this. It's not that kind of responsibility and it's not that kind of debt that we're, we're talking about, I think. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that the, uh, you know, uh, I think it was Camus who said about uh, uh, Kafka, Kafka forces the reader to reread and reread and reread. And I think Heidegger does the same thing to us in many ways. And I think you're right upon, you know, as Derrida says in Death uh, of uh, <laughs> the text always hides from the first comer. Right, in a sense, right? And so there is this, this aspect here. That this is about a hearing, right, in a, in a way. It's about a hearing differently. It's about, you know, in a way we talk about thinking otherwise. This is about hearing otherwise, just like Lacan in a certain way in terms of the, you know, the sessions. is the hearing otherwise, you know, in the psychoanalytic framework too. So it's not, not our standard way of bringing something to the text, our standard pre, uh, prejudices. And I think David's right. He's building up in this co-relational way and the debt is co-relational throughout, you know, the indebtedness to the previous conceptual, you know, frameworks, if you will, that he continually is building upon very systematically to get to this notion of the gestel. You know, how do we get to gestel? How do we get to inframing and then ultimately being ensnared by the inframing, right? Again, you know, and these kind of really legalistic language, the framing up, right, <laughs> et cetera. Another thing that I think Richard really is attuned to, to tonight is, is this whole notion of the etion as part of Greek legal theory, you know, Greek, le Greek legal language that is taken up in terms of, you know, uh, 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 causality ultimately and, and correlation. So th this is important. There are a lot of insights tonight, I think, uh, in this uh, in this session.
So yeah. Just, I just mean, quickly, I mean, you know, it seems one link yeah. is, you know, yeah. the, the, in this term, you know, this passage or this movement, right? We're talking about is, you know, he he talks about indebtedness. This is on <clears throat> the paragraph on bottom of page seven. The chalice is indebted to, i.e., owes thank, owes thanks to. The silver out of that which it consists. I that's not like a, an anthropomorphic indebtedness of guilt, but it also. And then you know he, right. then on the, the the page nine, you know the principal characteristic of being responsible is the starting something on its way into a rival. And it seems like you know maybe that's kind of where how he's you know developing this. Is it's like. <laughs> To, to anthropomorphize it maybe incorrectly, but I am indebted to my parents for my life. But then there would be another indebting and another. So it, it seems like that's kind of, it seems to me he's almost taking it out of just what David said, out of the realm of guilt. Right. And that sort of the, the, the humanization of this. Anyway, I just thought, you know. Right. Yeah. Okay. We we can we can uh, you know let, let's just move on just a little bit here. Yeah, if Michael, so, if we could just yeah, jump yeah. in real quick because the, the moving on I think is really interesting because he's about to and this is what you're about to get into, like expand on that a bit and and describe it as ways of occasioning and ways of bringing forth that I think are meant to make more clear exactly the, the yes sort of absolutely the concepts that we're now. Goes, goes on right. I mean you know the modes of occasion. This is page 11, right, of occasioning the four causes, right? So again, we have a, a shift in the language. We no longer talk about four causes. We talk about modes of occasioning, right? Shift, right? Within bringing forth. Through bringing forth the growing things of nature, fusis, right? As well as whatever is completed through the crafts and arts come at any given time to their appearance, you know? How they phenomenalize. But how does bringing forth happen, being in nature or in handwork or art? What is the bringing forth in which the fourfold way of occasioning plays? Occasionally, it has to do with the presencing, the anvesen, of that which is at any given time comes to appearance in bringing forth. Right? Bringing forth brings hither out of concealment, forth into unconcealment. Bringing forth comes to pass only in so far as something concealed comes into unconcealment. This coming rests and moves freely with which we call revealing. The Greeks have the word aletheia for re revealing, right, in a way. The Romans translate this with veritas. And you can begin to see the corruption that he's going to really speak to here. How does aletheia become veritas in history? How do we begin to take up Aletheia as the truth, right? <laughs> we do so because of its correspondence in, in philosophical history and history, if you will, and linguistic history. We say truth and usually understand this as the correctness of an idea, right? And of course, you know, some of you know Spinoza, the adequate idea, the adequate uh, idea, uh, the, the idea as adequatio. But where have we strayed to? How have we gotten onto this detour on our path? We are questioning concerning technology and now we have arrived now at Aletheia, at revealing. What does the essence of technology have to do with revealing? The answer, everything. <coughs> For every bringing forth is grounded in revealing. Bringing forth indeed gathers within itself the four modes of occasioning causality and rules them throughout, right? Rules them throughout. Within its domain belong end and means, belongs instrumentality. Instrumentality then is considered to be the fundamental characteristics of technology. If we inquire though, step by step into what technology represented as means actually is, then we shall arrive at revealing the possibility of all productive manufacturing lies in revealing. This is interesting, right? In revealing. The possibility of all productive manufacturing lies in revealing. Yeah. yeah. Technology is therefore no mere means, right? Again, technology is a way of revealing. If we give heed to this, 
then another whole realm for the essence of technology will open up. So we have a new dimension that's opening up. It is the realm of revealing, i.e. of truth, right? In, in a way, but not truth in the sense of Veritas, right? The prospect strikes us as strange. Indeed, it should do so, should do so as persistently as possible. And with as much urgency that we will finally take seriously the simple question, finally take seriously the simple question, the name technology means. The word stems from the Greek, technikon. Now I see the new corporation evolving here, the new IPO, technikon, right? Means that which belongs to techne. We must observe two things with respect to the meaning of this word. One is that techne is the name not only for the activities and the skills of the craftsman, but also for the arts of the mind and the fine arts. Techne belongs to bringing forth to poesis. Again, this relationality of language in terms of this dialogue with the ancient Greek, it is something poetic, poetic, poetic right? Excuse me. The other point that we should observe with regard to techne is even more important. From earlier times until Plato, the word techne is linked with the word episteme. This means they mean to be entirely at home in something. This is interesting, to be entirely home in something. Yeah, yeah, uh, then for knowing in the widest sense, but enti entirely in home, so to understand and be expert in it. Such knowing provides an opening up, right? Techne and episteme. As an opening up, it is a revealing. Aristotle in the discussion of special importance, chapters three and four of book six of the Nicomachean Ethics, distinguishes between episteme and techne, and indeed with respect to what and how they reveal. So techne is a mode of alethion. It reveals whatever does not bring itself forth and does not yet lie here before us. Whatever can look and turn out now one way and now another. Whoever builds a house, a ship, or forges a sacrificial um, chalice reveals what is to be brought forth according to the perspectives of the four modes of occasioning. This revealing gathers together in advance the aspect and the matter of ship or house with a view to the finished thing envisioned as completed. And from this gathering determines the manner of its construction. Thus, what is decisive in techne does not lie at all in the making and the manipulating, this is important, not in the using of means, but rather in the aforementioned revealing or unconcealing. It is as unconcealing or revealing, not as manufacturing, that techne is a bringing forth as a revealing, as a revelation, or really as an unconcealment. Thus, the clue to what the word techne means and how the Greeks defined us lead us into the same context that opened itself up to us when we pursued the question of instrumentality as such in truth might be. Technology is a mode of revealing. It comes to presence in the realm where revealing and unconcealment take place, where the aletheia, in the Greek sense of truth, happens. In opposition, to this definition of the essential domain of technology, one can object that it indeed hold for Greek thought and that at best it might apply to the techniques of the Kans craftsman. But it, but it does not simply, does not, does not infer the modern machine powered technology. And this is a, obviously, he's well aware of the Marxist uh, you know, views and certainly it, it doesn't want to be accused of being a Luddite or anything like that. And is it precisely the latter and it alone, that is the disturbing thing that moves us to ask the question concerning technology per se. It is said that modern technology is something incomparably different from all earlier technology because it is based on modern physics as an exact science. Meanwhile, we have come to understand more clearly that the reverse holds true as well. Modern physics, as experimental, is dependent upon technical apparatus and upon progress in the building of apparatus. The establishment of this mutual relationship between technology and physics is correct, 
but it remains a merely historiographical establishing a fact and says nothing about that in which this mutual relationship is grounded. The decisive question still remains, and this is, I think, the turn in the essay, of what essence is modern technology that it happens to think of putting exact science to, to work, to use. Okay, this, this seems to be the turn in the essay, you know, as we get a little bit outside of just with the, with the Greek. Anyway, what is modern technology? It too is a revealing. Only when we allow our attention to rest on this fundamental characteristic, does that which is new in modern technology show itself to us. And yet this revealing that holds sway throughout modern technology does not unfold into a bringing forth in the sense of poesis, the revealing that rules in modern technology is a challenging. So we have this opposition now being set up that's very important between the challenging versus the poesis, right? Very, very important, which puts to nature the unreasonable demand that it supply energy, right? Supply energy that can be extracted and stored as such. This is, this is very crucial here, yeah? But it does not, does not this hold true for the old windmill or as well? No, its sails do not indeed turn in the wind. They are left entirely to the winds blowing, right? But the windmill does not unlock energy from the air currents in order to store it. In contrast, and you know, he'll go to reserve stock later, you know, I, those of you that read the whole essay. In contrast, attractive land is challenged into the putting out of coal and ore. The earth now reveals itself as a coal mining district. The soil is mineral deposit. The field that the peasant formerly cultivated and set in order appears differently than it did when to set in order still meant to take care of and to maintain. The work of the peasant does not challenge the soil of the field. In the sowing of the grain, it places the seed in the keeping of the forces of growth and watches over its increase. But meanwhile, even the cultivation of the field has come under the grip of another kind of setting hyphen in hyphen order, which sets upon nature. It sets upon it in the sense of challenging it. Agriculture is now the mechanized food industry, right? Very interesting, right? Air is now set upon to yield nitrogen, the earth to yield ore. Or, or to yield uranium. For example, uranium is set upon to yield atomic energy, which can be released either for destruction or for peaceful use. Yeah, Richard, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I keep uh, thinking of, uh, you know, techne is also in the word politics, right? You mentioned Marx yeah. and, you know, one of the other great uh, associations in Greek for techne is the Antigone, uh, the Eros uh, uh, chorus, which is you know which is about dictatorship and you know you know Antigone. So it's a very political. Uh, so it's it's very interesting to hear. And then there's this uh, uh, in Plato the statesman. You know the politicos of state uh, of Plato, uh, and uh, where of course uh, you know is one of the uh, dialogues that foreshadows uh, the fate of Socrates, uh, and uh, who's put on trial. You know it's 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 just interesting about you know to hear in this somewhere also is the is the political implications of, of technology, especially speaking in our own time, uh, from, from our own, you know, the, the, the political uh, uh, resonance, uh, the way you could, of this, of these questions of technology. I, not that I have anything, anywhere to go with that, but it, it you know, I, 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 but of course that's something that uh, is a third rail for Heidegger, um, in, in a sense, uh, from where he is, um, you know, what, what's, what's transpired historically and where he is in relationship to it. Uh, so, you know, speak about something which is buried. It's just something I find, because 
you know, I mean, also, you know, the way that the Straussians would read Greek, uh, read Plato, is that Plato is constantly buried, you know, that there's something buried or, you know, there are layers, you know, the Straussian reading of Plato is that there are uh, layers of Aletheia, layers of things that need to be uh, revealed. And so you're constantly going back. And so, so it's interesting. So if you read Heidegger's text in a similar way, you know, it, 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 you know, it invites uh, layers of interpretation, uh, a whole hermeneutic process, uh, including, you know, what your, the, the association with Marx and politics. Yeah, no, a, a very good point. Remember, this is 55 too, as you know, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is the middle of the beginning of the new Federal Republic of Germany, right? There's also the East, the, the division, you know, all of these things are happening, you know, and if you go look at uh, the film like Der Ister and his reading of the poem of, of Holderling, I mean, it's very interesting to look at the, the river on one side in the West and how it's taken care of versus that of the East, right? <laughs> and, you know, the commentary that's going on by Jean-Luc Nancy, Philippe Lacoula Barth and others. So I think you raise, a, a, you know, a lot of great points here. I mean, I, I think in a way, yes, this, 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 this very layered thinking, the uncovering, you know, I, the, 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 the Straussians always would think of philosophers love to hide and they have to build codes that philosophers like Freud are, are paranoid. So they build a fortress, a code, a layer upon layers, you know, to, to do this. I'm not so sure I agree with this completely, but there are these layers of interpretation that are going on. Heidegger just doesn't come out and say the big corporations are ruining us. This is transnational, you know, corporations at work. He's really trying to get to a deeper, I mean, deeper levels, in my, my opinion. You know, it's much more than the, the, the surface description. And remember the distinction that I was trying to make between our firing and our liebness. You know, he's really trying to get to the deepest experiential level here, you know, as, as, much, as, as, as much as he can. This is a drive towards the primal meanings, right? And, you know, then, you know, somehow to get as close as you can to these primal meanings and the correlations that are going on. So yeah, mechanized agriculture that he talks about, you know, in the food industry, there was a letter in exchange with uh, Marcusa. I think I mentioned to you when Marcusa still lived in, in DC after he had worked for the OSS about, you know, when Heidegger made the comment that, you know, that he thought the combines, the agricultural combines and what they were doing to the land were comparable to the camps, right? In a sense. Well, it, it this also reminds me, Paula, uh, Paula Miali yep. has written a great little book about uh, a short story by Primo Levi, uh -huh. uh, which was, which on the surface is, uh, you know, he wrote these quote unquote, innocent little entertaining science fiction stories. Uh -huh. And, you know, and this is one about a couple and a girlfriend who's from the future and he's married and there's, but it's it's um, you know it's kind of it's it, it, you know what she brings out is um, in a very coded way he's associating the te the use of technology in modern uh, uh, Germany with uh, what it's supposed to have uh, and I use this advisedly buried so. You know, right. it, yeah, so it, there are, yeah, there are associations here. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can see why the environmentalists would take him up too. You know, you begin to get this, you know, this ability of, you know, the domination of nature, you know, the William Loveth who wrote, I mean, uh, Lees who wrote the book, not Loveth who translated this, uh, William Lees who wrote The Domination of Nature, Trent Troyer, you know, The Domination of Nature, uh, The Critique of Domination. You begin to see this whole movement within Marxist uh, thinking too, you know, and, and an ecological thought, you know, this kind of attempted synthesis, uh, you know, of, of, of Marx and nature, even though, 
you know, we always have this problem. Nature does not think. <laughs> Nature does not, you know, engage in dialectics, right? Uh, contrary to what Engel says, nature does not have consciousness, right? In some ways, we're the ones that have this. And that, that opens up another, you know, can, can of worms. But, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, good, good, good point. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, I like the way, I mean, you know, you can really see the film at work here, right, in many ways. There's this kind of repetition of, uh, you know, the, the mechanized food, food injury, uh, you know, the business. You can go killer of sheep in some ways, you know, kind of even take that to Charles Burnett film and read this into this as a product of, you know, this, this uh, you know, bringing forth, you know, how this is happening in our modern modern period, you know, the in order. But let, let, let's go on just a little bit with what right. You wanted to say something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just, you know, again, I, I find, <laughs> I feel like we could float. I mean, um, I, he, he says uh, back on page 13, technology is a mode of revealing. And then he, you know, talks about revealing and unconcealment. There's other things I've read uh, by him where, you know, that the action of sending or the giving is also contains within it a, a concealing and a, a holding back and a hiding. And so it just, it, it, to me, it just raised an interesting question as to, I mean, there's something even deep, you know, deeper than technology really going on underneath all this thought, I think, for him in, in a certain mm -hmm. way. Like, and it's, it's almost like it, it raised for me, like the question of, well, what is really being revealed? in the sense that there's also, you know, the, the non-presence, what is concealed. And it, I, it, it, it was just interesting to me, but then here, you know, he, in the page 14, he, the revealing that rules in modern technology is a challenging, which puts to nature the unreasonable demand that its energy supply can be extracted and stored as such. Not everyone would say that's an unreasonable demand. Uh, for one, I mean, there's there's a kind of a moralistic valuation that's already you know creeping in to to the argument, um, but I just it it seems like I, I I just was curious like how other people read what he's he's doing here that the revealing if the revealing is this challenging right and then that will come in you know morph into sort oh, of the, the rule yeah. it's not the revealing that's the challenging it's the rule that is a challenging the, the, Wait, the, the rules it rules is, is a challenging as a rule it's a domination right if you will it's a it's a hegemony right it's okay. hegemony. A, a colonization or a, an imperialism yeah i think the footnote for that vorstellen uh or the Footnote 14 is pretty good on that, Michael. Yeah. But revealing is bringing something, it's, it's bringing forth. It's, it's a, like something is being sent at the same time. There's a giving. There's, there's a coming forth. And it doesn't seem like we should immediately conflate that with instrumental domination. Although that's definitely, I think, where he goes with this later on. You know that it, it, he doesn't it, speak about instrumental domination anymore. He talks about challenging. It's a new language. But, but we we just use the term yeah. dominating. Yeah, yeah, that was that was came yeah. up here, and and it seems I, I I just I I, I don't well, think again. I, I think he goes on to talk talk about this. You know, he 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 speaks. Uh, you know, the, the verb stellung, the very good footnote there about Verstellen, Vorstellen, Darstellen. You know, Marx uh, used this very actively. My mode of presentation is different than my method of uh, research. You know, the Darstellen, Vorstellen, you know, uh, that he uses very much. Well, you know, and representation is Vorstellung. This is part of, part of what the stake is, you know, going back in the German, right? Is the stake of representational thinking trying to get outside of this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, by by the quote present scene, you know, et cetera. So look, look, let's just go on. This setting upon the challenges forth the energies of nature is an expediting. You know, again, a, another interesting verb, uh, expediting the fordern, right? And in two ways, it expedites and it unlocks on one hand and it exposes. 
Yet that expediting is always itself directed from the beginning towards furthering something else. That is, towards driving on the maximum yield at the minimal expense. Yeah? I mean, think about capitalist extraction here. The coal that has been hauled out in some mining district has not been supplied in order that may simply be present somewhere or other. It is stockpiled. That is, it is on call. You know, I mean, it's a ni nice phrase here. The on-call coal, you know, <laughs> reserves, right? The on-call oil in in uh, in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, right? The the strategic petroleum reserves of the United States. It's on call. It's very interesting the way. He does. I mean, it's pretty magnificent in terms of you know thinking about the materiality of the extraction of resources, right? And you know, extractive, uh, you know, capitalism, if you want. It is stockpiled, that is on call, ready to deliver the sun's warmth that is stored in it. The sun's warmth is challenged forth for heat, which in turn is ordered to deliver steam, whose pressure turns the wheels that keep a factory running. You know, very, very, very important what is unfolding. The hydroelectric plant is set into the current of the Rhine. It sets the Rhine into supplying its hydraulic pressure, which then sets the turbines turning. This turning uh, sets those machines in motion whose thrust sets going the electric current for which the long distance power station and its network of cables are up to set up to dispatch electricity. In the context of the interlocking processes pertaining to the orderly disposition of electrical energy, even the Rhine itself appears as something that, as our command, again, going back to this notion, all right? of command. The hydroelectric plant, challenging, right, is not built into the Rhine River as was the old wooden bridge that joined bank with bank for hundreds of years, right? Rather, the river is dammed up into the power plant. What the river is now, namely a water power supplier, derives from out of the essence of the power station in order that we may even remotely consider the monstrousness that reigns here, let us ponder for a moment the contrast that speaks out of the two titles. The Rhine as dammed up into power works and the Rhine as uttered out of the artwork in Holderlin's hymn, right? By that name, Verister, right? Right here, right? But it will be replied, the Rhine is still a river in the landscape, is it not? Perhaps, but how, right? in no other way than as an object on call for inspection by a tour group ordered there by the vacation industry. He's kind of funny too. I mean, he does have a sense of humor. Yeah, so I, I don't know, any any thoughts about this? I mean, before we go on, I mean, he goes into the airline industry. Maybe Jeff can uh, say, is this the way Boeing uh, <laughs> operates, you know, the next uh, couple of pages, the runway and the object and all of this and the, yeah, the, anyway. So yeah, he's, he's moving towards what he calls standing reserve, the setting upon the indeterminate and the standing of work. work. He's, he's asking what kind of unconcealment is happening, what is peculiar to stand forth, the challenges. You know, he asks these questions as he goes through this. I mean, very, very carefully. I'm not saying you have to agree with this or, you know, buy it lock, stock, and I'm, that's not the issue. The issue is this is a very tightly woven you know, uh, peace, you know, in which it's step by step, it's going on. Richard, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just quick, I mean, the, the, it, it, you know, the thing is that this also then relates to how the human being is seen. I mean, that's where he's going to go, but this is, you know, the middle voice, the sense of, of the relation of the, uh, you know, we've been talking about cause and such, and the relation of the, of, of, causality in relation to the, the the silver chalice or whatever it is that this way of of looking at this relationship to the technology the object will be then you know uh, it will come to pass in regards to the subject in regards to the human being I mean that's uh, you know that human beings are thought of as in a similar fashion. Right. This is a question. Um, 
for people who have read Bean in Time, I mean, is there is there something this again gets back to this revealing and unconcealing, like what is being revealed, which you know we'll eventually find out is the standing reserve and in Freeman. But what like does Heidegger try to ever articulate? It's almost like the underlying ground, right, from which that which presence comes into presence. Well, you can speak to that. The underlying ground is the hypochemy and, you know, the underlying substance, the underlying ground, you know. And in German, you know, you have the primary, the Urgrund, the Abgrund, the abyssal plane, the Grund itself, right? You have many, many grounds, you know, in this, you know, uh, you know, and uh, yeah. That's, that's well, the he talks later that this is jumping ahead, but that, you know, the, the, the danger in all this is it deprives us of the object. Right, that that we that that he's talking about, and I just wondered, like, what his under understanding of you know what he's articulating here to this you know other level of being. I mean, if something is being revealed, if something is being unconcealed, while something remains concealed, there's something prior, right, to what is being revealed, and many it, it's. Right, he's not talking about an ontological essence of nature or the world. I don't think that's what he's saying. Is that physics has penetrated into the, the you know the, the real substance of what is, right, or the real nature of what is. Well, I mean, first of all, he's far away from being in time. You know, there's a reversal that takes place after the war. You know, it, it, it's an unfinished project being in time. Some people read, you know, time and being as, uh, you know, part of the, be the beginning of part two that was never fulfilled. And, you know, time is really the, not only the horizon, but it is time as being. So this is a question of t t time, temporality, uh, you know, well beyond zeitgeist, worldviews, and all of this, and and world pictures, right? So th this is one thing that is sort of presupposed in his his writing at this point, right? So so yeah, so in some ways, yeah. And being in time is again uh, uh, the, the question of being here. This this is the question about technology as a, as a as as a new moment, you know, that is is maybe the transitional moment, and this is what we're living through in some ways is this great transition uh, between the the epoch of self consciousness, right, and you know all the attack on self, right, all the attack on subjectivity, all the attack of this, is this preparing the ground for this new revelation, if you will, or this new unconcealment of, of, of techne ruling, but at the same time, opening this space to go back to what Douglas mentioned, does the line ultimately reveal a liberating moment, right? Is the technology where the greatest danger is can also be that greatest that greatest moment of liberation? So this is where he is. I mean, you're not dealing with someone that's you know playing a little academic game of trying to explain something. These are you know he and Junger and you know Heidegger in particular in this essay is really trying to say this is very dangerous. This is very very open end. You know he's not saying you just rush head headlong into the danger, but the technology's power is so great through this command, right? Through this challenging, you know, all of this, that, you know, unless we, you know, we don't need to harness it at this point, we need a, a way to find out where its liberatory potential is, you know, and not be, you know, overrun by it in terms of its instrumentality. This is why I think he goes there in the beginning to stay away from this means ends moment, right, et cetera. I mean, you look at Wall Street, you know, just think of this in terms of everyday political economy. The amount of money that has been made in Silicon Valley, you know, 
in some ways. I mean, this is astronomical. You know, it's it's basically the exponential at work all over the place, you know, in terms of this means to ends of technology. Has it really liberated us in any 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 real fashion? You know, we have more misery. Depression is now number two disease in the United States, you know, after obesity, obesity and, and diabetes. And that's just reported depression, not, you know, all this symbolic misery, et cetera. So we, we really have, I, I think this is very, very serious in terms of everyday life and, it's, and, and, our, and our practices and what we're actually experiencing at this point. And I think he's giving us clues in, in a way to kind of think this through in a, in a very different way. You know, this is otherwise thinking, a kind of thinking so far out of the normal box that, you know, we have a hard time, you know, coming, coming to, to, to terms with it, right? So, so it's very interesting, you know, if you go on to say, um, you know, um, um, you know, the, the, he goes on to talk about, you know, the, the indeterminate, the challenging. At the top of page 17, you know, this is very important. What kind of inconcealment, unconcealment is it then that is peculiar, that which comes to stand forth through the setting upon the challenges? Everywhere, everything is ordered to stand by, right? To be immediately at hand. Indeed, to stand there just so that it may be on call for further ordering. Whatever is ordered about in this way has its own standing. We call this standing reserve, bishtan. The word expresses here something more and something more essential than just mere stock, than more mere inventory. The name standing reserve assumes the rank of an inclusive rubric. It designates nothing less than the way in which everything presents that is wrought upon by the challenging revealing. Whatever stands by in the sense of standing reverse no longer stands over against us as object. And then he goes, yet an airliner that stands on the run runway is surely an object. Certainly we can represent the machine so but then it conceals itself as to what and how it is. Revealed, it stands on the taxi strip only as standing reserve, inasmuch as it is ordered to ensure the possibility of transportation. For this must be in its whole structure and in every one of its constituent parts, on call for duty, ready for takeoff. Here, it would be appropriate to discuss Hegel's definition of the machine as an autonomous tool. When applied to the tools of the craftsman, his characterization is correct. Characterized in this way, however, the machine is not thought at all from out of the essence of technology within which it belongs. Seen in terms of the standing reserve, the machine is completely unautonomous, right? For it has standing only from the ordering of the orderable. The fact that now, whenever we try to point to modern technology as the challenging revealing, the words setting upon, ordering, standing reserve, obtrude, and accumulate in a dry, monotonous, and therefore oppressive way, has its basis in what is now coming to utterance, right? Who accomplished the challenging setting upon through which we call the real is revealed as standing reserve? Obviously man. To what extent is man capable of such a revealing? Man can indeed conceive. You know, in a way, this is again a reading going back to uh, uh, Richard and I both are very fond of Antigone, you know, the ode to man, right? <laughs> Nothing so strange as man, right? Man is on it. This is a rereading of Antigone in, in a kind of the light of technology and technique. Can conceive, fashion, and carry through this on one that went way or another. But man does not have control over unconcealment itself. This is, this is crucial, does not have control over unconcealment itself, in which at any given time, the real shows itself or withdraws. The fact that the real has been showing itself in the light of ideas, and here we go, the forms, right? Since the time of Plato, Plato did not bring about. The thinker only responded to what addressed himself to him. Yeah, okay, so this is very important, right? Only to the extent that man for his part is already challenged to exploit the energies of nature can this ordering revealing happen, 
Not, not only challenging revealing, now ordering revealing. If man is challenged and then ordered to do this, and I think there's a difference, then does not man himself belong more originally than nature within the standing reserve? The current talk about human resources, supply of patients for a clinic gives evidence of this. The forester who in the wood measures the felled timber and to all appearances walks the same forest path in the same way as did his grandfather is today commanded by profit making in the lumber industry, where whether he knows it or not, right? He is made to the orability of cellulose, cellulose, which for its part is challenged forth by the need for paper, which is then delivered to newspaper and illustrated magazines. The latter, in their turn, set public opinion to swallowing, and I, I like his verb, to swallowing what is printed so that a set configuration of opinion becomes available on demand. Yeah, yeah. Yet, precisely because man is challenged more originally than are all the energies of nature, i.e. into the processes of ordering, he never is transformed into mere standing reserve. Since man drives technology forward, he takes part in ordering as a way of revealing. But the unconcealment itself, and this is again, is crucial, the unconcealment itself within which ordering unfolds is never a human handiwork any more than the realm through which man is already passing every time he as a subject relates to an object. Where and how does this revealing happen if it is no more mere man, handiwork of man? We not, need not look far, and I, I'm, we'll probably end here soon. We need only apprehend in an unbiased way. That which has already claimed man and has done so, so decisively that it can only be man at any given time as the one so claimed. Whenever man opens his eyes and ears, unlocks his heart, gives himself over to meditating and striving, shaping and working, entreating and thanking, he finds himself everywhere already brought into the unconcealed. This un the unconcealment of the unconcealment of the unconcealed, excuse me, has already come to pass whenever it calls man forth into the modes of revealing allotted to him. When man in his way from within unconcealment reveals that with presence, it merely, he really responds to the call of unconcealment, even when he contradicts us. Thus, when man investigating, observing, ensnares nature as an area of his own conceiving, he has already been claimed by a way of revealing that challenges him to approach nature as an object of research. Until even then, even until even the object disappears into the objectlessness of standing world, world uh, yeah. So standing reserve. Modern technology, and maybe we should end here and we'll pick up with this next week. Modern technology as an ordering revealing is then no merely human doing. Therefore, we must take that challenging that sets upon man to order the real as standing reserve in accordance with, with the way it shows itself, in which it shows. That challenging gathers man into ordering. This gathering concentrates man upon ordering the real as standing reserve. That which primordially, very important, unfolds the mountains into mountain ranges and courses through them in their folded togetherness is the gathering we call mountain chain. That original gathering from which unfold the ways in which we have feelings of one kind, we name gemut, disposition. We now name that challenging claim which gathers man hither to the self-revealing as standing reserve, gestel, in framing. We dare use this word in the sense that has been thoroughly unfamiliar up to now. Maybe we should leave it at Gestel. I don't know about you. I mean, I, I obviously can go on, but I think this is a crucial st st stopping point. The, the prefix Ge, Geberg, the mountain chain, the Gemut, the disposition we have, the gathering together. And then finally, now he's going to get into the heart of the matter, the Gestel, right? The inframing that technology does, right? Yeah. Anybody want to say anything, please? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Richard, yeah. Uh, no, unfortunately, I have to go. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, 
I mean, we can pick it up uh, next yeah. week. You know, I think it's a really good place to stop. Give us a chance to catch up on yeah, Gestalt. Give us a chance to reread. Yeah. You know, like uh, reread your Kafka. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> read the Heidegger, and uh, you know, we can re, re kind of rethink it too. I mean, you know, it's a very very powerful uh, essay to put put it mildly, right? And we can go back to a lot of the things that I think uh, you know. Uh, uh, Doug Carl, Patrick, uh, David Winters, and Richard brought up very, uh, very good, nicely tonight. And of course, what Josh brought up, the whole question of Vorstellung and this whole verb family of the Stellung, you know, the explosion. And the Stellung is going to be used too in terms of uh, uh, what the Frankfurt School and Walter Benjamin, mm -hmm. the, the constellations, right? I, I think uh, uh, one nice kind of uh, thread to this or you know, a movement is you know where we stopped and then what happens on page 26 27 i think is okay okay well, well we'll we'll go there next time right on freedom and that's where we encounter the danger yes we do the supreme danger not the, the danger <laughs> the supreme danger <laughs> right right beneath right. right okay good all right, all right. Sounds good. and the saving power <laughs> Did you say that? The saving power. Yeah, they're, they're, Danger and the saving power. And the saving power together. Absolutely. Yeah. Very well put. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. you know, redemption in German is saving the phenomena. Yeah. That's that's the, the word. Solar phenomena is, a, is the notion of redemption used by Rosenzweig and many people. Yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, good. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So yeah, we'll pick up next uh, Tuesday. I'll send out a uh, thing. Jeff, did you want to say something about the airport or? Uh... No, I was just commenting okay. on that. Okay. Paragraph there at the end, uh, the final sentence on page sixteen, where he's talking about the Rhine. That phrase by a tour group ordered there by the vacation industry. I think that's a uh, quite brilliant uh, way of looking at modern tourism. Yes, it's a great stroke, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Very, it's very good. It's exactly what it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and Stanley Diamond uh, kind of rephrased that in search of the primitive that the anthropologist that just observes and doesn't participate is the relativism of the tourist. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. The relativism of the tourist. Those, yeah. those passing through. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also Good. just wanted to say, like, I found this, uh, this is a essay on, on time and being. Yes, I very, very helpful in terms yeah, of go ahead. Go ahead. This, this later essay. Yeah. Oh, I, I have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I read, um, the one on uh, the end of metaphysics also. The right. End of philosophy is, is very, very. Yeah, I mean, the uh, one, one text I really love is the uh, end of philosophy and the task of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Closure in philosophy. And they were working through that closure of the metaphysical. Field. And then that's the way through, et cetera. This is going to take two to three hundred years, but anyway, it's okay. <laughs> you know, let's hope we set the we set have time. The, 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 the footprint, the right way, whatever the, the steps. <laughs> yeah, good. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Hey, and thank I'll, you, Michael. Thank you. Tuesday, seven o'clock. Right yeah. next Tuesday, we'll put it out. Not Monday.